Hello. All right. I get to wear these fancy headphones, so try not to be jealous. Okay, so um, Stephanie asked me to come present tonight on common classroom behaviors and some helpful support. So specifically, she was asking for me to give some advice for parents on how they can actually help their teachers be more successful with their students, essentially. So for those of you who do not know me, I am a behavior analyst. Um, so what that means is that I have my master's degree um, in a related field. I have gone through behavior analytic coursework. I have done supervision under a behavior analyst. I have passed board exam. Um, and then every year I continue to do all of the educational components that I need to maintain that um, with the certification and all of that. So I work a lot with individuals with um, autism, a lot of individuals with Down syndrome, ADHD, or just individuals in general that need some behavioral changes to occur. Okay, so I will get started here. So the first thing I wanted to do is kind of talk about teachers um, and their training and their roles within the classroom. So I know that a lot of us rely on teachers to kind of do quite a bit for us. Um, you know, we want them to have the ability to, you know, teach our kid and also help change their behavior and make sure they're getting their socialization and all of these things. But the truth is teachers are just people who have had specific training and that training is oftentimes not specific to behaviors. So kind of just going over again what their background is here. So most teachers do not have specific training in behavior. They typically get training in kind of best um, practices for education, but it's not specific to like problematic behaviors that may be occurring in the classroom. They oftentimes are focusing on state standards, kind of teaching um, what those learners need to be able to do in the classroom. Um, if they are in a special education class, um, oftentimes they're trained on what the varying disabilities are and kind of how to help differentiate teaching for learners with higher skill sets and learners with lower skill sets. But again, it's not really specific on here are behaviors and here's what's going to happen and this is how you figure out how to respond. A lot of times they lack that specific training um, and you know, with there's no magic solution to responding to problem behavior. Really what it comes down to is um, why they're doing what they're doing and the different environmental factors that are playing into it. So each situation is going to be different and without having the really strong understanding of these various principles on behaviors, they're not going to necessarily know how to respond. Um, so they oftentimes will have resources in school settings, uh, but it depends on what the school has available. So some schools have really great resources. Some schools have very limited resources. Um, and even if they have those resources at the school, you have the resources in your child's IEP. Um, those resources vary, again, based on what their knowledge and training is. So some schools have behavior specialists. Um, but their training could be very different. I've been to um, schools where those behavior specialists are very equipped um, and are very knowledgeable in the science of behavior analysis. And I've been to some schools where literally the person said to me, well, I was on leave and I came back and someone who took my spot is now the gym teacher. I used to be the gym teacher, so now I'm just the behavior specialist. She has no specific training. It's literally just another person they put in the room when a kid's having problem behavior just to help minimize it. But they're not necessarily getting ahead of it and preventing it from happening in, happening in the future. So, you know, just keep in mind that teachers are not necessarily very trained on behaviors. Um, and so this stuff is not necessarily going to come naturally to all of them. And even if they might have a lot of experience dealing with problem behaviors, that doesn't mean that they were effective at changing it. So that's an important component to just keep in mind. So what are behaviors? So while we're talking about this, the first thing we need to do is understand what are behaviors? You know, a lot of times people automatically assume when we say behavior, we're talking about problematic behaviors. But what behaviors are, 
from the perspective of a behavior analyst are just observable events. There's something that someone does that I can see happen. You guys can see me using my hands to gesture right now probably. You can see that I'm scratching my nose. You can see that I'm hitting the table. You can see that I'm engaging in these behaviors. It's an observable event. And then when we're talking about them, we need to also you know, differentiate between those desired ones and those less desired ones. Um, we don't want to use emotions to describe behaviors because what the way that you feel when you know, you're angry and the way you look and respond is gonna look very different than how I respond when I'm angry. So using terms such as angry or anxious or she got upset, those emotional terms to describe what a learner is doing or how it's happening, it's not really very effective for me to understand what the behavior looks like. So we really need to understand what it looks like. Um, and then with behaviors, kind of what we need to do is we need to look at what's occurring before a behavior and what's occurring after. So what's occurring before is the antecedent. This is what occurs immediately before a behavior occurs. Typically a problematic behavior is what we're focusing on. So let's say the teacher tells everybody to sit in a circle on the squares. Okay, so that would be the antecedent. The behavior is the learner elopes from the classroom. So that's what it looks like. She ran from the classroom. And then the consequence is what occurs immediately following the behavior. And that needs to be pretty specific because sometimes people, again, will just be like, oh, I stopped her and brought her back. Well, there's probably many other things that happen between that and we need to know what that is. So if the learner elopes and the first thing the teacher does is scream their name and the learner looks back and smirks and takes off running and then the teacher runs after that child, all the while that child's giggling and laughing, that's important to know because that's going to come in to why that child is doing what they're doing. So it's important to really be specific on really what it looks like. I kind of tell people, I need to be able to play this little A, B, C, antecedent behavior consequence in my mind like a little video. So as it's being described to me, I can see exactly how everything played out. And then what we do is we look for patterns in those ABCs to determine the function. So we're looking for patterns and behaviors. So the functions. So this is the why behind why we do what we do. This is the reason that we do it. Everybody, by human nature, we are lazy, right? Like we're gonna go with the path of least resistance to get our wants and needs met. So we're not gonna do a lot of things that require a lot of effort when it doesn't work. So it's important to recognize that even though the child may be engaging in a behavior that you would rather them not engage in, that it is serving a purpose for them. It may not be the behavior we want them to do, but they're only doing it because the world has taught them this is how you get your wants and needs met. And it's important to recognize that. So all behaviors, fortunately for us, fit into three categories. Pretty simple. Our kids are actually not trying to trick us, usually. They're not trying to manipulate the situation. They're just trying to get their wants and needs met. And it comes down to three really basic things. It's to get something. I want access to your attention. I want you to come give me hugs. I want you to give me a big response. Um, it's uh, to access an item. I want the iPad. I want the cookie. I want a drink of water. Or it's to access an activity. I want to go to the park. I want to go to the pool. So it's to get something. The second one is to escape something. I don't want to do the math homework that you're giving me. I don't want to brush my teeth. There is a kid next to me that I don't like and I want him to go away. I have a headache and I want that headache to go away. It's to get out of a situation. And then the third is what we call automatic reinforcement um, or kind of like sensory reinforcement. Basically what that is, is it's something that we do that feels good. It's like scratching an itch. No one has to give me anything. I'm not trying to get out of anything, but what I'm doing feels good. So it might be twirling something, rubbing something, twirling my hair, biting my nails. So it's just something that feels good. So again, our kids are not trying to be super sneaky and manipulative. They're just trying to get their wants and needs met. So we can figure out through those patterns from the antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence why they're doing what they're doing. 
So if I see a behavior happen two or three times, I can see what occurred before, what occurred after, and say, okay, this is pretty clear it was to get out of doing circle time, or this is pretty clear they were trying to get access to the iPad. So usually I can figure it out pretty quickly from looking at those patterns. Um, now where it can get a little trickier is that one behavior can serve multiple functions depending on the situation. So the learner, uh, let me think of something here. So let's say he squeals really loud. So it may be that sometimes he's on the swing and he's having a good time and he just loves to squeal and he loves this high pitched noise like woohoo, I'm having a good time, squeal, squeal, squeal. Okay, that would be automatic. But then he's also learned if he's in circle time and he starts squealing that he's gonna be taken out of circle time because it's disrupting the learning of the other students. And so then he's put over on the bean bag and given a book. So, okay, now I squeal because I, I like it and it feels good, but I also squeal to get out of doing work. Or I squeal and everyone starts yelling like, don't do that, that's too loud, it's hurting my ears. And so he's like, everybody's giving me so much attention when I squeal. So now that same behavior, depending on what the situation is, you can see, can serve a different function in each situation, right? So that can be a little bit tricky to know, okay, he squealed, but now I have to know why he's squealing right in this moment, so I know how to respond in this moment to this behavior, because the way I responded earlier when he was on the swing isn't gonna work in this situation. And then it can also be a little tricky too because one behavior may start out as a function for one thing and then quickly change or take on a secondary function within that same episode. So for example, let's say uh, our learner uh, is squealing again, screaming a little bit um, because he wants to gain access to the iPad. So you're like, I know why you're doing this. I told you no to the iPad and you want the iPad. Pretty easy to figure that function out. I'm not gonna let you have the iPad now because this is not how we get it. So the screaming is still occurring. So now what's happening is the teacher or the parent is getting down to the learner's level and explaining, trying to reason with this individual why we don't scream, why we can't have the iPad right now, you know, it's time to do our work. And there's this like really beautiful five minute back and forth exchange. And then at the end, you know, we're hugging it out and, you know, sharing that moment. And then we go about our business. So very quickly, that learner could be like, hey, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed the attention I got for it. So I'm gonna explain this like a scratch off lottery ticket, right? So oftentimes we play the scratch off lottery ticket because we wanna win the jackpot, right? We want the big payoff. So if the learner's engaging in this problematic behavior to get a million dollars or say the iPad, great. Don't give them the million dollars, they probably won't pay, play again. Unless they get a, scratch off that gives them the opportunity to win a new scratch off ticket. So as you can see, like it started to get that million dollars, didn't get it, great, but you know what? I did get a free ticket to play again. It's not why I bought the ticket, it's not why I purchased it in the first place, but it's pretty good and so I'll probably play that game again. So you can see if it starts for example, to gain access to something and they quickly learn, I get a lot of attention during this time, it's gonna take on that secondary function of attention. So I hope that makes sense to anybody. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and take a drink here. All right, so talking about behaviors, how are behaviors shaped? How are behaviors you know, increasing or decreasing um, in this, the learner's repertoire? And really it's through the consequences. So we're talking about that ABC, this is the C of that. How we respond when a learner engages in a specific behavior determines whether they're gonna do that behavior again in the future or not, essentially. So some of the um, consequences that we can look at would be reinforcement, punishment, planned ignoring, and blocking and redirecting. So reinforcement. Reinforcement is something that immediately follows a behavior 
and increases the future frequency of that behavior. A lot of times the word reinforcement or reward is used and it's often used incorrectly. So individuals will say like, oh, I'm, I'm reinforcing this behavior or I'm doing that. But the truth is we don't know if something acted as a reinforcer unless we see the behavior increase in the future. So if you're giving a child, say a cookie, um, for completing his math homework, but he's not getting better at completing his math homework. He still needs a lot of help. It's still a battle every time. That cookie's not acting as a reinforcer, okay? So it's important. It's got to immediately follow the behavior, and it's got to increase the future frequency of the behavior. So the other thing about that, so we talked about the future frequency increasing. The other thing is immediacy. While we're trying to teach a learner, a new behavior or change something, we want to make sure they're being uh, reinforced immediately following that behavior. So we want to have whatever it is we're going to be giving them or doing for them readily available. If your child responds to verbal praise, that is exactly what we want from every learner everywhere. Verbal praise is so easy to give. You don't have to have anything prepared. It's with you at all times. You can give it in a small amount. You can give it in a big amount. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Great. Not all learners are quite there yet. Verbal praise maybe isn't the most valuable thing to them, um, but maybe Skittles are. So having the Skittles with you and on your person or ready to dole out the moment they're doing what you want them to do, be prepared to have those things, okay? And that could be edibles, toys, bubbles, movies, pretty much anything a child likes could be a potential reinforcer. And you can determine what those reinforcers are by asking the child, watching what they seek out, you know, providing choices. Um, so it's just important to know what your child really likes and then be able to give that contingent on these desired behaviors. So it can be something too. So this is where sometimes people will get confused. Um, reinforcement can be something where it's being added to the environment. So if I give verbal praise or I give a Skittle, I'm adding that to the environment. That's positive reinforcement. Reinforcement can also be where something is removed from the environment. So this is the exact example of um, I have a headache and I take Tylenol, and the Tylenol removes the headache, okay? Or I have a kid sitting next to me that I don't want sitting next to me, so I hit him, and that kid moves. I've removed something from the environment, but it's still increasing that behavior of hitting, right? So people sometimes get confused because those like positive and negative, they tie the emotional connotation to that, but that's not what it is. I say, think math. You've got a plus sign and a negative sign. You can add something to the environment or you can take it away. But what's important is to recognize, is it increasing the, fu the future frequency of that behavior? If it is, it's acting as a reinforcer, okay? so. Two things that are really important to note about this are that we cannot assign reinforcing value to another person. So a lot of times people will be like, oh, this is a, a more socially acceptable thing that they should be doing, so I'm gonna give them this instead of this other baby toy that they really like. I know that they love Blue's Clues, but they're in second grade. They really should not be watching Blue's Clues in second grade. You can't just give that to someone else, right? Like I can't just tell my husband that, well, I know that you like coffee ice cream, but I don't like coffee ice cream. I don't think it's an appropriate ice cream for you to eat. So I'm actually going to give you strawberry ice cream. He's going to be like, what? What? You can't just tell me what ice cream I like, right? So this is the same idea with reinforcement. We cannot tell someone what's appropriately reinforcing to them. The only way we'll know what's working as a reinforcer is by watching that future frequency increase, right? Um, but if you know the child well enough, you can pick out things you think might act as a reinforcer. And my thought is, even if it's not the most socially acceptable behavior that they wanna engage in, I had a learner that really loved spoons Okay, like playing with spoons is not something most four-year-olds and five-year-olds want to do, but it really loved spoons. I gave him a time and a place it was okay to access spoons. So it didn't set him aside from his peers anymore, but it was the opportunity to give him reinforcement for those desired behaviors. Um, and so I think it's just really important because especially in a school setting, which is kind of what we're focusing on right now, there are limited reinforcers oftentimes available. And so they'll be like, oh, well, all kids love to get on the computer and do this particular game. So obviously Susie's going to love it too. Well, 
Susie may not love that, okay? So it really has to be catered to that child. It has to be something they have motivation for. The other thing is that we cannot arbitrarily assign a schedule for reinforcement, okay? So what that means is I can't say, um, you know, oh, well, it's really convenient for me to only allow you to have reinforcement for the last 10 minutes of the day because otherwise I have all these other competing things that are requiring my attention that I don't have time to deal with you throughout the day, but if you are just doing something that I want, like at the end of the day, I'll give you 10 minutes. Well, that's a very arbitrary, not catered to the individual approach to doing it. Um, and if your child has not ever been able to go a full day without engaging in the problematic behavior, that's not suddenly gonna change most likely. Now, sometimes we can start with that and after a few days, if it's not working, then we have to increase the amount of reinforcement. I'm, a, I'm okay with the idea of starting with the thing that's the easiest and then coming back, you know, like cutting it until we get to the point where the learner is successful. But the truth is we have to kind of look at how frequently does it happen. If that happens 10 times an hour, I can't expect that learner to go all day without engaging in a problem behavior. That's just completely unrealistic. I need to meet them where they are. Um, and oftentimes that's where the data comes into play. And so the another issue within the school setting that we run into is that, again, their resources are limited. And so they don't have all the time in the world to just write out everything that's occurring with a learner. So it's hard to get them to consistently take data on what's occurring. So if we can make it easy for them to take data, if we have like a little checkbox and we just say, you know, at 7.55, Johnny hit and kicked and I put him in timeout, like if they could just check it, sometimes that makes it easy, um, you, whatever it may be. So data collection is something that's sometimes very challenging to get collected in that kind of environment. So again, the easier we can make it, the better. Something with this too, I'm gonna stress this later, but I have gone into dozens and dozens of different classrooms, different schools, seen a variety of teachers, some whom I've adored and some whom I've been like, how are you a teacher? Like, obviously you hate children, why are you here? Um, you know, and it just depends on who you get and their background and their personality. But every classroom I go into, it does not matter if it is the person that I'm like, I cannot wait to uh, get this person for my own child, or if it's the person that I'm like, I would never send my child here. The one thing I can say that is very consistent across every environment is that there's never enough reinforcement. I go in a lot of times to observe learners and I will ask, hey, how many times do you think you're giving praise statements a day? How many times do you think you're giving corrective statements? And we as human beings are not very aware of our own behavior. We can see what other people are doing pretty easily, but we're not very aware of our own behavior. And so they will always say, oh, I give lots of praise. I um, am super fun. The kids love it. But oftentimes when I'm observing, I see significantly less reinforcement occur than I do corrective feedback. And so that's a pretty important thing to keep in mind. When we're talking about wanting to increase behaviors, we wanna increase desired behaviors. We want these kids to learn what we should be doing um, and to, so that they stop doing this other thing we don't want them to. And the only way they're going to learn is by being reinforced for that desired behavior. So it's really important to get the teacher on board with the concept of giving lots and lots and lots of reinforcement. People will often say reinforcement isn't natural or I don't I don't think I should have to give him something for doing this because it's something he should do. And the two things about that. One, reinforcement is extremely natural, right? Why do you go to work? You go to work to earn a paycheck. That's your reinforcement. You're not going just for the fun of it usually. You're going for something. There's a payoff. And just even going back to when uh, you know our babies are learning to use the toilet for the first time, they're not gonna just use the toilet because we're like, this is the thing you have to do. They do it because we set them on it, we give it a lot of praise, we make it a big deal, we reinforce them a whole bunch because we meet them where they are, which is not toilet drained, and then we're reinforcing them lots and lots of successes. They get lots and lots of rewards and tickles and praise. And then over time, we fade that out. 
as a 32 year old woman, I very rarely get praised for going pee pee on the potty anymore. The only time it happens is when my now three year old praises me because I've been praising her. So, you know, it's not like people are like, oh, you're wearing your big girl panties today. I'm so proud of you. Good job. You stayed dry all day. And yet, here I am, still pretty successful at using the toilet. Very rarely do I wet my pants, okay? So somehow, I learned that behavior and then I was able to maintain it, even though I'm not getting that praise or cookie every time. And the concept is the same here. We start with really a lot of reinforcement, a very dense schedule of reinforcement while we're, we're trying to teach something. But we're not gonna do that forever. We're not saying this is a lifetime crutch. We're saying use this tool the way it's meant to be used, which is to increase the frequency. And then over time, once that learner is doing that desired behavior so much that we can start to fade out the use of that reinforcement, okay? All right. Punishment. Okay, so this is something that is used pretty heavily. Even though the word punishment is very taboo, people will say, oh, we're all about positive behavioral supports. That's like a buzzword right now. That's great. The concept of um, using positive uh, supports is wonderful, but oftentimes people don't truly understand what a punishment is. They think that a punishment is something that's like inherently bad. And what it is, it's something that immediately follows a behavior and decreases the future frequency of that behavior. So there are many, many things that happen throughout our days that are punishing to us. Okay. So if I um, answer the phone and it's an unknown number, I pick it up, I answer it, and it's a telemarketer, I've just been punished, okay? I'm like, I'm not gonna answer an unknown call again because I don't want that to happen. If I call a friend up and I'm like, hey girl, and then she's like, hey girl, who are you? You don't speak like that. I'm not gonna call her up and do that again. That's punishment. It decreased that behavior, okay? Now, punishment can be a versus, it can be extra work, it can be a timeout, it can be all those things, right? Um, but it could be hugs. If I do something for someone and it's not my children or my husband and they come and hug me, I typically am not super into that. You know, I don't like being hugged by strangers very much. So that's gonna punish me. In the future, I'm not gonna do that same thing for another stranger if I think I'm gonna get a hug. Um, so. That concept, you know, it's again, it just is something that decreases the future frequency of that behavior. And the same as with reinforcement, it can be something's being added to the environment or something's being taken away. It can be positive or it can be negative. Again, think math, not emotions. So if it's uh, a punishment where I'm yelling, obviously I'm adding my yelling to the environment. If it's a punishment where I'm taking away recess, then I'm removing something from the environment, okay? So a lot of times in the school setting, there are um, kind of contingencies set up like, oh, Johnny hit his peer, so he couldn't go out to recess. So that is basically meant to be a punishment, okay? Um, so something with this is we cannot assign, or so I already went over this, but we can't assign reinforcing value for someone. We also cannot assign punishing value. So even though it may be something that you don't like and would punish you, you have to watch the behavior. If taking recess away is not changing that behavior, it's not acting as a punisher, okay? You can't just arbitrarily assign it. Same thing with yelling. If yelling isn't changing that learner's behavior the way you want, if it's actually making it happen more, it's not acting as a punisher. Just because you think yelling should be something they don't like doesn't mean that's how it works. It's either it increases the behavior or it decreases the behavior. And so if you're yelling and you see that behavior occurring more and more, it's not working as a punisher. It's actually increasing the behavior. It's a reinforcer, okay? And I do stress, um, again, you know, that positive behavior sports is great and we should always try to modify behaviors through reinforcement based strategies first. And the reason is uh, punishment 
uh, often results in kind of this emotional backlash. So the learner will, you know, if they lose recess, and that is maybe an effective punisher, they're going to cry. They're going to maybe drop to the ground. They're going to hit. You know, there's going to be a bigger response that you get in return to it. Um, and then also just no one wants to be that person. No one wants to punish their child constantly, right? Like you want to walk in and be the good guy. You don't want to be the good, bad guy coming in, okay? And then the most important thing, the most critical piece about this, the reason why punishment in and of itself isn't really what we should be using is that it doesn't actually teach anything, okay? So by definition, punishment decreases a behavior, okay? That's it. It doesn't mean that because I punish this behavior, another more desirable behavior is automatically going to take its place. Now, with my son, who is five, he is neurotypical. He learns so quickly. It's amazing the things he can pick up. And then recall, months and months later, he is absorbing just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of information every single day. So if I yell at him for, let's say, throwing balls in the house, I can punish that behavior, but he has this whole skill repertoire of behaviors that he can pull from and be like, I know 30 other ways to play with balls and he can replace it, okay? So he can just automatically take this uh, previous behavior that's now been punished and replace it with a more appropriate desirable behavior. But if my learner doesn't have the ability to kind of pick up on information like that all the time and doesn't know that there are these 30 other ways to get the same want and need met, all I've done is punished a behavior. I haven't actually taught a desired behavior. So we have to effectively teach that. We have to let them know, I'm gonna reinforce this other behavior instead. Um, does that make sense to everyone? I hope it does. So again, punishment by definition only decreases behavior. So if ever we're using punishment, we do need to make sure that what we're doing is effectively teaching what we do want instead. Okay. And I'll give a, just one more example here. If I have a learner that kicks me to gain access to a cookie because he doesn't have language, he doesn't have the ability to speak vocally to me, he just kicks me and throws this tantrum and eventually I start offering him things to get him out of the tantrum. So he's learned if I go up and I kick her, eventually she's going to offer me a cookie and that's what I want. So he's learned kick cookie, kick cookie. Well, if I decide I'm not going to tolerate being kicked anymore and I'm going to punish it and I want to yell at that kid, I want to say, don't do that anymore. That hurts. And he cries and goes away for a bit. Great. I can punish the kicking, right? Like I can punish that. I can make it stop. Perfect. That's what I wanted, right? I didn't want him kicking me anymore. Except exactly like I said before, what I have failed to do is actually teach anything. That child still wants a cookie and he has no way to get that cookie now. And eventually he may want that cookie bad enough. He's going to try kicking me again because again, that's the only way he knows how to get the cookie. So if I'm going to punish kicking me, I also need to be aware that that behavior isn't suddenly just gonna be replaced by something that I want and said, I am responsible for teaching that. I have to go now, teach that child to sign cookie, sign cookie, get lots of reinforcement, teach them, teach them, teach them. So that over time, when he wants a cookie, he's not gonna resort back to kicking me. He's gonna say, hey, she taught me this new thing. It's much easier. It still gets that same need met. I'm just gonna do that instead, okay? Planned ignoring. So planned ignoring is um, basically where we're ignoring an undesired behavior. Um, it's planned and advanced. So we are doing it with intention. We're not just ignoring a child when they're doing something that annoys us. We're doing it for um, behaviors that we know they're doing it to get a reaction. And basically we're gonna be as non-reactive as possible. I've planned ahead that this is what this learner does and I'm gonna be non-reactive to it. So it can be avoiding making eye contact, it can be avoiding talking about it, it can be you know, pivoting away and doing something else as appropriate. It's basically trying to give as little reaction as possible. A lot of times people get really confused and think that means ignore the child. That's not what it means. I'm still very aware of what the child's doing. I'm still, maybe if I told them to um, 
you know, get their shoes and they start screaming, I'm still expecting them to get their shoes. I'm not suddenly going to start ignoring that child um, and be like, well, I'm just not going to talk to him for the next 10 minutes because he's screaming. That, that doesn't work. What it means is I know this child's doing this to get a reaction and I've planned in advance just not to give them that reaction. Okay. And then the moment that learner is doing a desired behavior, I really need to focus on making sure that they get the attention that they were seeking. So even if they're doing something for 20 minutes, that's super obnoxious. I need to be focused on teaching um, what is desired. So the moment they do what is desired, if they're being calm, if they say my name nicely, that's how they get my attention, okay? So planned ignoring, it's not ignoring the child, it's just ignoring a behavior kind of that's occurring in the schedule. Blocking and redirecting, super simple thing to do, uh, blocking. So it refers to physically preventing an undesired behavior from occurring. So examples may be like running from the room, hitting a peer they're sitting next to, hugging others inappropriately and so on. Um, so typically to block a behavior, there's a clear motor action that's associated with it. Like I know that this is hitting and I know that when they get up and start running like that's you know gonna be an elopement so I know what these behaviors look like and then I'm able to like physically prevent it from happening so if the learner is taking off out of the room I can put myself in the doorway and just block it I don't have to big give the huge response I don't have to start yelling I don't have to tell him he's a naughty kid anything like that I can just literally prevent it from happening same if they're sitting next to a peer and they raise their hand and you put your hand up and you know catch their wrist and then put their hand back down into a neutral position. That's something that you can do to block as well. Um, and then redirecting refers to providing a learner with an alternative, more appropriate behavior. So let's say um, he does go to hit his peer and I block it. And instead of putting his hands down necessarily into a neutral position, what I'm going to do is I'm going to prompt him to tap the shoulder. So I've redirected it like this is how you do it. Or maybe uh, he is going to elope and I block it and then I redirect him to sitting down and playing on the computer because I know he loves the computer. He's not going to elope from that. So um, this is you know a really effective strategy and a lot of people that do it do it very naturally without even thinking about it they're very good at it i see this used a lot of times very effectively um, but something people sometimes forget about is that this can be done before a behavior occurs getting ahead of a behavior is going to be so much more effective than having to respond to a problematic behavior later, right? So if a teacher knows the learner's um, triggers, they can work to get ahead of it. Um, and this is called an antecedent manipulation. So we talked about what antecedents are. Those are what is occurring prior to a behavior. So basically, the teacher saying, I know this situation is a trigger. I'm going to manipulate the situation so that it is not a trigger. That's what an antecedent manipulation is. So these are things that include changing up the environment or how things are presented prior to the behavior occurring to prevent it. So a few things that I put on here, and these this is just like a very small glimpse of the science, a very tiny taste. Um, but a few things on here that I put are to pair, to verbally mediate the expectations, non-contingent reinforcement, and setting up rewards. So let's go, and go, let's go over pairing. So what this is, it's the process of basically building and then maintaining a rapport with a learner. So the way that we do this is we often begin with very intentional, very um, excited, high energy play and following the child's lead. So when I first get a kiddo that I'm working with, the first thing I want them to do is adore me. I want them to think that all good things in the world come from me. So when he walks in, he sees me, he's excited. And this is a really critical component that often gets overlooked in many other disciplines. And the reason is not because they don't care. They do want a relationship with a learner and they want them to be successful. It's because they don't necessarily have the luxury of time I, as a behavior analyst, have the luxury of time with my learners often. You know, I know that I have two hours, 10 hours, 40 hours if I need it to spend that time developing this relationship, okay? Not everybody has that luxury and I respect that, but it should be still a huge focus for everybody because people like to do things for people they like. 
if you are the person coming in and demanding a child immediately start work, so if you're a physical therapist and you're coming in and you're saying, okay, we're going to do these really hard things, these things that are really challenging for you, and we're going to work really hard for this one hour, that learner is very quickly going to, you know, start throwing tantrums when they see you. They're going to start screaming, no, they're not going to be want to be around you. So we really need to put a lot of focus on pairing. We need to make sure the child wants to be there. They want to be with us. They enjoy us as people. They know that good things come, okay? Oftentimes that make them work idea or concept or like I have one hour, I just need to get as much done as I can. If you spend, you know, 10 minutes of that hour pairing and the last 50 minutes working, I guarantee that session is going to be much more effective, that 50-minute session. You're going to get so much more done than you did in that hour of trying to force the work, okay? So it's really important to make sure that the relationship is built. Verbally mediate expectations. Um, so making sure that the learner knows what the expectations are. So sometimes, particularly when our learners have limited expressive language, we forget how much they understand. Um, and then we fall into this idea of just simply responding to them instead of setting them up for success. So I do not care if it is a learner that um, can speak very fluently or a learner that has zero words that they can tell me and have give zero indication that they um, understand what I'm saying. I'm still always encouraging everybody constantly to make sure we're giving them, them those expectations as much as possible upfront and reminding them throughout the day. I say, always assume they understand. It's not gonna hurt anything by talking to them, okay? If we're doing it before problem behavior occurs and I'm telling them what I want, you know, all I can think is it's probably just gonna help. So, and then remind them throughout the day what that desired behavior is um, and focusing on what we do want, not what we don't want. So a lot of times I'll hear like, we don't hit our friends. We don't hit our friends. We don't hit our friends. Again, it's kind of like the same concept as punishment. Like that's just telling me what you don't want. It's still not giving me what you do want. So I need to focus on telling the learner what I do want. So maybe something like, we have nice hands around our friends. We fold our hands around our friends. We high five our friends. Those sort of uh, statements would be a lot more effective and reminding them constantly. So like, okay, remember, we're about to go sit at circle time. We need to have nice hands when we're near our friends, okay? So sit here, nice hands. I'm gonna remind you, nice hands. Good job with your nice hands. I love that you have nice hands. Nice hands, just kind of reminding them over and over and verbally mediating those expectations. Non-contingent reinforcement. So this is basically the concept of giving the child something that they like without it being contingent on any specific behavior. So I know that Susie likes Skittles and throughout the day, I'm just giving her Skittles. Doesn't matter if she's doing circle time, it doesn't matter if she's singing song, if she's working on a worksheet, if she's just hanging out on the computer all day long, I'm just giving her non-contingent reinforcement. Um, some other examples could be like putting a learner in your lap during circle time. They didn't do anything to earn getting on the teacher's lap. They didn't um, necessarily engage in a specific behavior, but they love attention. They just love being cuddled. And you sit down and you just pull them on your lap, handing out popcorn because you just happen to have it available. That's non-contingent reinforcement, kind of all those things. Um, so the way to use it effectively is to recognize the function, the why behind what they're doing. If they're doing it to gain access to attention, for example, like I know he's gonna do this specific thing so that I have to come over and respond, um, or another kid's gonna give a big reaction, then prior to them engaging in that undesired behavior, if you can give lots of attention throughout the day, they're not gonna need to engage in that problematic behavior because it's already getting, their, their wants and needs are already getting met, right? It's not because they're doing something specific, but they're just getting a lot of attention. So they don't need to have a problem behavior or act up to get it. And maybe it's, um, they're doing it to get out of work. I get he's gonna have to eventually do work, but if throughout the day, I'm giving him the ability to escape work, I'd be like, you're doing, um, you know, 
anything but the problem behavior, you know, I'm, I'm going to let this happen where I'm like, you know, everybody, we're just going to take a break right now. We're all going to go to an extra recess. We're all going to do these things so that they're escaping the situation they want to escape. They're not going to have to ha engage in a problem behavior to escape it, right? So just trying to manipulate, manipulate, excuse me, those variables, um, and so it needs to meet that same function. Now, this can be done on a set schedule. So maybe, for example, you know, attention and attention's like a big one that all of our kids, you know, all of our kids engage in attention-seeking behavior. So. Um, let's say he's really attention seeking with these problematic behaviors that, you know, constantly kind of having to go over and attend to him when he's having the problem behaviors. And it's like every seven minutes on average, I have to go over and respond. Well, what I can do is I can say every seven minutes I have to go over and deal with him. So I'm just going to get ahead of it. And every five minutes, I'm just going to go over and give him attention. So hopefully he's never doing these other things like throwing the markers or hitting his peers. So I'm going to get ahead of it and I'm just going to have the schedule where every five minutes I'm going to do it. And as that learner is successful, obviously that's something, again, like we talked about before, we'll fade it out. But initially, we have the schedule. Or it can just be more variable. Um, it can just be kind of throughout the day as you remember. Um, but as long as it's getting ahead of the behavior and it's offsetting the need for the learner to engage in that behavior, that's fine. Um, setting up rewards. So again, like we talked about, it's very natural to work for something. It's very natural. I'm working to earn a paycheck. The same is true with our learners. So setting up a reward system where they know the rules and they know the expectations and they know what they're gonna earn for doing what we want is gonna be very beneficial. And so what we need to do is, again, determine what is going to be successful for that learner, what they are motivated for, not what I say they're motivated for, but what they are motivated for. It may be ice cream. It may be iPad time. It may be able to ride the bus home, whatever it may be. They're working for something that they are motivated for. Um, the schedule is worked out in advance. They know that if they go all of circle time without engaging in this target behavior. If they have nice hands, they have nice mouth, they follow directions, they can earn this thing. Um, that That's fine. Um, and then what we need to do is make sure that we are setting reasonable expectations. So again, like I said earlier, if he typically only makes it two minutes in circle time before he hits his peer and then he needs to be removed, I can't expect him to then sit for a 20 minute circle time without hitting his peer once. That's just unreasonable. But maybe I set the expectation at two and a half minutes, maybe just a little bit beyond where he is right now, two and a half minutes, and then you earn a reward, okay? Um, and the rewards, so I understand that teachers are gonna have uh, limited resources. They're not gonna be able to just give the kid ice cream in class, right? So something we can do is set up like in a token economy where basically they earn stickers or tokens um, to be able to exchange that later for the ice cream. But token economies would be a whole nother presentation for a whole nother hour, um, can be very complex. So if this sounds like something like, oh, I really wanna do this, I do encourage you, feel free to reach out to me um, so that I can get more in depth on that. Um, because people will often do this, they'll say sticker charts. I was giving him stickers and he wasn't doing it, like it didn't work. Well, they have to actually be conditioned to work first, there has to be this whole kind of science behind it. So it's not just as easy as giving them a sticker and saying, that's your reward. There has to be more to it. But setting up a reward system is, I'm going to say multiple times throughout this, the most critical thing we can do. It is something that is often lacking the most in these environments is they have to have the dangling carrot to work for. Otherwise, what's the point? They're not going to do it. So we have to make sure we're doing it. And then as they're successful, what we want to do is fade out slowly. So if my goal is to get Johnny to go all day without hitting his peers, um, you know, I'm going to make sure I build that, that up. And then once he's going all day without hitting his peers, I'm not just going to stop that schedule of reinforcement. And that's often what happens. The moment the child is doing well, we forget and we stop giving them the thing that they're working for. And basically what that does is teach them that you should go back to hitting because that served your function 
or that served what you needed better than doing this other thing because you don't get anything for it now. So we have to make sure that we don't just suddenly stop. We fade it out over time. So initially we get up to the day and then we go two days and then three days and then we go a week. And then over time we fade out the very contrived kind of schedule. But I just tell him, you know what? You've done so well. It's been two weeks since you've hit any friends at school. You've had nice hands the whole time. I'm so proud of you. We're going to go to Monkey Joe's. So you just kind of like over time, just kind of intermittently reinforce them a little bit for being successful. We don't just stop it. But over time, we just kind of keep talking about it and fade it out and fade it out. Um, so some strategies. So some things that you can do. So you now may very well have more training on behaviors than your child's teacher. No joke, that may be legitimately true. And you've got, again, the tiniest amount of training on behaviors that I could possibly get. This could go on for hours and hours, um, but I only had one, so I had to kind of condense it. Um, so when you are thinking about how to help your child's teacher at school, recognizing that they don't have this knowledge um, necessarily, so they're not gonna just be able to know what to do is one. Um, the other is we talked about pairing for your child's teacher, like, you know, they, it's so critical that they develop the relationship with the learner. The same is true for you with the teacher. You need to have a really good relationship with them because people like to do things for people that they like. If you are someone who comes in and is very pleasant and brings them cookies and very helpful, when you ask them to do something, they're going to be more likely to do it. If you're someone who's very challenging to work with and you don't have a good relationship and it's very contentious, it's going to be a lot harder for them to want to do it. They may grudgingly do it because it's in the IEP, but they're not going to do it as well as they could, right? Um, if you don't understand what's you know going on with your um, child's IEP goals and things like that too, you know that's again having that relationship. You're going to want to be able to ask um, and you know advocate for them in that way. And again, having a really solid relationship is going to be the best way to do it. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to get to the point where you're very aggressive with them, but always start with honey, right? Um, the other thing to keep in mind, so teachers necessarily don't have that training. So you're going to have to help create the plan, whatever it's going to be most likely, or you're going to have to help guide them a little bit and be the voice of reasoning while talking about it because they will try to set these arbitrary schedules of reinforcement. They will say, he's going to go all day and then have 10 minutes of the iPad. And you were like, he's not going an hour. Let's talk about this and figure out what would be reasonable for him and then change it over time as he's more successful. Um, so you're going to have to help be part of that and advocate for that. Um, but you also have to recognize as you're doing this, whatever you're asking of the teacher, it cannot require much more effort than what they're already doing. Anything that requires them to do more work is very quickly going to be pushed to the side and not done. So if it's something that can be done easily, like giving them a sticker on a sticker chart that it takes two seconds to walk by and give them, or giving them an M&M or whatever it is. If it doesn't require a ton of effort, they're much more likely to do it. So trying to kind of focus on just a couple things that are easy for them to follow through on and don't require a lot of effort. Um, and then the other thing that is important and for you to um, keep in mind as you're thinking through things that are gonna help your learner and how, ways to help the teacher is thinking that if the plan isn't working, there's a couple things. Don't stick to a plan that's not working. If you're not seeing the changes you want within a couple weeks at maximum, I usually say three to five days, but I'll give it up to two weeks. If I'm not seeing the changes that I want, the plan needs to be evaluated. But before I change the plan completely, first I need to make sure it's actually being implemented. You'd be surprised at how often I'll get these calls because the parent will be like, well, um, you know, this isn't working. You know, we thought it was working and then it isn't working. And I'll go in and check and I'm like, it's not working because it's not being done. You know, that's it. That's just not being done. So we have to make sure it's actually being done. Um, it's being done with the integrity in which it was created, um, that they're accessing the rewards that they're earning and all of that. Um, 
And then if that isn't, like if they're doing it and they're doing it well and it's still not working, that's when we need to change the plan itself. That's when I need to say, okay, maybe we need to do more reinforcement. Maybe we need to do something different here, whatever it may be. Then we look at changing the plan. And then um, I put this as the last slide. I'm gonna say it again. <laughs> it's most critically the very least um, that we want to do, and but, but still the most critical, is getting a schedule of reinforcement in and implemented, consistently implemented. Um, because it is hard. It's not something that a lot of people think about. That it's not done naturally. They're going to forget about it. Um, you know, they're going to be like, you know, oh, I, you know, he was doing so well, so I stopped doing it. Making sure that there's a schedule of reinforcement in and it is being implemented for those desired behaviors is the most critical because whatever behavior gets reinforcement is going to increase in the future, right? And if we're reinforcing desired behaviors, the appropriate behaviors, and they're getting the reinforcement, those undesired behaviors are naturally going to die off because they're not going to need to do it because they have this other skill that they can use. So it is 8.59, I have one minute left. So I know this is a lot of information and it's hard for everybody to kind of get such a small glimpse and really understand um, what I'm talking about and what this means. So I'm sure that after viewing this, you're gonna have specific questions about um, your child, what they do, what their teacher can do. If you want to reach out to me, Stephanie is welcome to share my contact information. I'm happy to talk to anybody um, about anything that they need support on and to go over these concepts again on a more one-on-one -on -one kind of situation catered to you and your situation. So um, thank you everybody for tuning in and I hope you guys have a great night. Thanks.